Welcome to the last week of the With You teaching series. And I'm so thankful that you guys have all gone on this journey with me. It has been such a blessing to me and I pray it's been a blessing to you. We are gonna end this series with a powerful, inspiring faith story of David and Goliath. This is an epic battle story in the Bible and I cannot wait to dive in with you today. Life is full of battles and blessings. It's full of peaks and valleys, trials and triumphs. And there's giants that come against us in this life and they come against our families and they come against our faith and they try to keep us from moving forward in the promises of God. But the good news is the Bible gives us tools on how to overcome these evil giants and walk in victory. In today's story, we're going to see how the power of God's presence was with David and how God showed up mightily in the battle he faced against a giant named Goliath. And we're going to discover the power of God's presence in our lives against giants that come against us and try to defeat us. We have the power in Christ to take down Goliaths. We have the power in Christ to take down Goliath. I want to begin today by defining a Goliath. A Goliath is any person or thing that stands between you and God's promises for you. It's anything that tries to stop you from moving forward in the faith. And I found this fascinating when I was reading the story of David and Goliath in the Bible. The word champion is mentioned twice when referring to Goliath. And the word champion in Hebrew is pronounced Habaim. Habaim. And it means the man standing between the two. My brother-in-law, Josh, he's 6'5". He's my husband's oldest brother, and he's a gentle giant. I mean, he's precious, but we are really close to my husband's family, and they come over all the time. And a few years ago, when my youngest son, Boone, he's now nine, when he was two years old, they all came over for dinner, and we were all in the kitchen. And I said, Boone, come in here and come say hi to the family. And so Boone, I just remember he runs around the corner to come and say hi to all of us. And my brother-in-law, Josh, was trying to be funny, and he hid behind a corner against the wall, and here comes Boone, and right as he rounded the corner, he jumped in front, and he goes, Rah! and he just tried to scare him, and he was just trying to have fun, but I watched Boone's little face, and it just melted in fear, and he ran the other direction in tears, and Josh felt terrible. He said, oh my goodness, I wasn't even trying to scare him. I, I was just trying to play with him, and Boone, like, forever had PTSD. Anytime he was around Josh, he, he had to, like, earn his trust back, and I said, Josh, you don't realize how big you look. You looked like Goliath to Boone. He came running around the corner. And, and you look big to me. And it scared him to death. And, and it sort of gives us a picture. Our enemy, Satan, has champions of darkness. He has supernatural Goliaths that he sends out trying to scare us, trying to intimidate us, trying to stop us in our tracks and keep us from moving forward in freedom. And when these Goliaths come against us, they seem huge and looming and scary. And, and we feel like they're insurmountable. We just, we just can't get past them. And some of these giants, they take on many forms. It could be an addiction that you just can't seem, seem to get over. Or it could be a bully or an intimidating personality in your life. And you just, you just need to confront them, but, but you're just paralyzed in fear. Fear can be a giant. Shame can be a Goliath in your life where, where you just can't move forward in the promises of God. See, the Bible is filled with promises that God, is, that God has for us as believers. They're meant for us. I mean, we're promised eternal life, but Jesus says, I came to give you abundant life as well. We have access to abundant life. And abundant life is applying the promises of God to our life here on earth. Some of those promises include freedom. They include peace, victory over evil, hope. God promises us productivity. He wants us to be fruitful. We have a calling and a purpose in our lives. We're promised the forgiveness of our sins, mercy in our time of need, unlimited grace, intimacy with Jesus, and we're promised the power of God. We have access to power. Another promise we have is we get to be a part of the family of God. We belong. We're not alone in this life. And see, Satan, our enemy, he can't have our souls in Christ. He can't have our souls. So he wants to ruin our abundance life here. He wants to divide us, isolate us, discourage us, and keep us in bondage. But Jesus empowers us. 
And in Jesus, in Christ, we have the power to take down Goliaths. Jesus defeated the enemy at the cross. And when we're connected to him, we have the power to live in victory. We're going to see this principle played out in the inspiring faith story of David and Goliath. This story takes place in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And this is an Old Testament story. And I want to begin by giving you a little background of what's going on in this time period. It's a time period of 950 B.C. before Christ. And this is the time of the kings in Israel. King Saul was the first king of God's people. So the Israelite people had settled in the promised land. And they had been previously slaves for 400 years under the Egyptians. And God raised up a deliverer, Moses. He set the people free and he brought them into the promised land. And God said, listen, this is a land that I'm, I'm giving you as an inheritance. This is a land that I promised you. I want you to go take possession of this land. This is a good land and it's yours, but it wasn't barren. It was occupied. God's in it. There was a lot of enemies there, enemy territory. And God told his people, listen, you're going to have to fight these battles, but I'm going to give you victory because I'm with you. I'm with you. So don't fear your enemy. Go claim your land, take possession of your land. So God's people did that. They came into the land. They fought some battles. They're settled that they're thriving there. And God is their King. But, but as they started to look around at the pagan nations that still were in the promised land, they, they were influenced by them. And they saw that they had kings, warrior kings, human kings. And God's people said, we want a king we can see. We don't want to just have God as our king. We want a warrior king. We want to be like these pagan nations. And God raised up a prophet at that time period named Samuel. And a prophet would speak to God on behalf of the people. So, pro, so Samuel took this to God. And he said, your people want a king that they can see. And God says, I'm their king, but they're rejecting me as king. Give them what they want, but, but it's going to come with some consequences because I'll let them have a human king, but, but they're flawed. Humans, it's, gonna, it's not going to be good for them. So the people chose Saul as their king in 1 Samuel 1, 9. The Bible says they chose Saul because he was a head taller than all the other Israelites. And this is going to be significant in our story. The people approved him. He looked the part of a king. He looked tall and he looked powerful. And it says 40 years that Saul was a God honoring king, the Bible says. God helped him. But then Saul began to stray from God. He became rebellious. He rejected God. And God's spirit, his anointing, left him. The power that God had given Saul left him. And God told the prophet Samuel, He said, I'm going to choose a king that after my own heart. I want to choose the next king. Because God was still going to shepherd his people, He was still going to protect his people. So He told Samuel in 1 Samuel 16 1, He said, I'm sending you to a man named Jesse in Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be the future king because he's a man after my own heart. So Samuel went and to Jesse in Bethlehem, and Jesse had seven of his sons pass before him. But, but Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen these. Do you have another son? Is there anybody else? And Jesse said, well, we have my teenage son, but, but he's out in the sheep fields. He's a shepherd. And Samuel said, well, call him in. Call him in. So they summoned him from the sheep fields. This is David. He's a teenager. He's coming in smelling like sheep. He, he has his shepherd clothes on. And the Lord said to Samuel, anoint him. He is the one. Samuel then took the horn of oil. He anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, I love what the Bible says, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David in power. The Spirit of God came upon him in power. And in the Old Testament, when somebody's anointed with oil, that this is a symbolic act that they're set apart for a sacred service. Priests and kings were anointed with oil for a special mission from God. God set them apart. And with the anointing, the Bible says, comes God's power. This is a foreshadowing of what happens to us in the New Covenant when we have the Spirit of God. See, the oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And when we accept Jesus as our Savior, when we say, Lord, we want to be with you in this life, He rushes upon us. His Spirit comes upon us and anoints us, and we're set apart for God's services. This is what's happening here. This is a picture. And just as God chose David, God, Jesus, chose you. He died for you. I love this. In Acts 1.8, it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit rushes upon you. This is meant for us today. 
So David has the anointing power of God on him. He's going to be the future king of Israel. And at this point, this was a secret anointing. Nobody knew besides the people in that room and God that he was going to be the future king. And it would be 15 years until David would become king of Israel. I mean, God was going to train him during this time period. And I just found this interesting. He would become king of Israel when he was 30 years old, just like Joseph became the head of Egypt at this time, we learned about last week, and Jesus began his earthly ministry at 30 years old. So they're foreshadowing Christ. This is a pattern. But at this point, David is covered in oil. He's wearing his shepherd clothes. He wasn't looking for this. And he, and he goes back to, to being a shepherd. I mean, he just goes back to his day job. He's kind of going, well, what happened back there? What was that? And it just kind of reminds me of the Christian faith. And I want to talk about that for a minute. We have these experiences with God. I mean, we come to Bible study and we feel the Lord's presence and we feel his power. At times we're moved to tears. We, we sense his nearness. And then a few hours later, we, we, we're driving carpool or we're going to the grocery store or we're just going back to ordinary. And it's such a picture of, of human, of Christian, our Christian faith because we, we kind of think, well, where's God? What happened back there? Well, what was that? How do I apply that kind of power to the mundane, to the everyday routines of life? And see, I just want to encourage somebody. God is at work, even when you don't feel him. He's at work in the ordinary. He's training you. He's preparing you. There's a purpose around the corner. He was teaching David how to be a flock to this little shepherd of sheep because he was going to have to be the shepherd of the flock of Israel. He's training you. Nothing's wasted with God. And we're going to see that play out in the story. Our story begins in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to read the beginning so we know what's happening here in this battle. It says, the Philistines drew up their troops for battle in the valley of Elah. Saul and the Israelite people came together, spread out their troops in battle readiness for the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill. The Israelites occupied another hill. And there was a valley in between them. So much of life is fought in the valley moments. I have a picture of this valley today. It's famous. This is a modern day picture of Israel of the Valley of Elah. It's still there. We see the two hills and the valley in, the, in between. So a battle is about to be fought here with the Philistines coming against God's people. The Philistines were vicious enemies of the Israelites. They occupied a portion of the promised land, the land that God had given his people. And their army came against the Israelite people and they challenged them to a man-to-man -man battle. And this was a um, common battle strategy in this day and age. One side would send a champion from their side. Another side would send a champion. And they would, the, men, the two men would fight it out. And whoever won between the two won the battle. This avoids having the whole army have a bloodbath. So this is what's happening here. And see, winning this battle is crucial to the Israelite people. They had already been slaves for 400 years. And the Philistines said, if we win, you're going to be our slaves and we're going to take your land. And so the Israelite people needed to win this battle. They didn't want to return to bondage. They didn't want to return to slavery. And see, Satan, our enemy, wants nothing more than a free person to return to bondage. I mean, this is a tactic he still uses today. He's behind this. 17.4, it says a champion named Goliath came out from the Philistine camp. And he was over nine feet tall. Commentaries believe he could have been up to 9.9. Nine. And see, I looked this up, and there is an ancient race of giants from the city of Goth, which is where the Philistines lived in Israel. And they're descendants of the people of the Anakites. And there's evidence that these giants existed. These were real people. This isn't a folk story. This isn't pretend. These are real, live giants. So Goliath came out, and the Bible is very intricate in what he wore. He wore a bronze helmet on his head. He wore a scale of armor of bronze. His legs were covered in bronze greaves. He had a javelin and a spear, and the point of his spear alone weighed 15 pounds. Just the point of it. All of his armor weighed up to 125 pounds. He is huge. He is intimidating. And the Philistine people were metal workers. This was their trade. So they had all access to all this intricate, ornate um, armor, and the Israelite people didn't have this. So, so just seeing the battle, just seeing the people lined up for battle would have been an intimidating sight, not to mention this huge giant. And when he came out, Goliath began to shout to the ranks of Israel. He said, pick your best fighter, pit him against me. If he gets the upper hand and kills me, we will become your slaves. But if I get the upper hand and I kill him, you will be our slaves and you will serve us. I challenge the troops of Israel this day. Give me a man and let me fight him. 
at the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelite army, they were terrified and they lost all hope. They lost all hope. And and I want to pause here because Saul was the king. He was the leader of God's people and he was the tallest man among the Israelites. He would have been the obvious choice to fight Goliath. But we see he has the heart of a coward. He's not going to go fight on behalf of God's people. He's too afraid. So Goliath came out every morning and every evening and he screamed the threats to the Israelite army for 40 days. Uh, 40 is a symbolic number in scripture. You see 40 all throughout scripture. It's a time of testing. Noah was in the ark for 40 days and 40 nights in the flood. Moses went up to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was in the wilderness fasting, overcoming temptation, 40 days and 40 nights. The Israelites were in the wilderness wandering around before they went to the promised land for 40 years. This is a time of testing. God's going, who is going to take me at my word? Who is going to go take possession of this land that I told you you're already going to get? I'm already going to give you victory. Who's going to trust me? David enters the chapter. Again, he's summoned from the sheep pasture. Jesse, David's father, told him, David, take this roasted grain, this bread and cheese, down to your brothers. They're fighting at the Valley of, El- Valley of Elah. Take him some lunch and report to me on how the battle's going. So, so David's doing the ordinary. He's running errands. He's a glorified pizza boy. He's taking lunch to his brothers. He's not looking for a fight. He's not looking for anything special. He's being obedient right where he is. And God has a purpose for him. It says he ran to his brothers on the battle line and greeted them with the lunch. And as he was talking with them, Goliath stepped out from the lines and shouted his usual defiance. But David heard it. When the Israelites heard it, they ran in fear. And David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David's going, who is this guy? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And what that means is who is this man that's a pagan? See, circumcision was a mark that you were God's people. It was an outward symbol. It was a mark of the covenant. And he's going, this man isn't with God and God's not with him. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? And we see a battle begin. I'm going to give you three points if you're taking notes. We're going to see three ways that the power of God's presence shows up mightily in David's battle against Goliath. Number one, God gave David the courage to fight. Number two, God gave David the ability to win. And number three, God gave David the blessings of victory. We're going to apply these things to our lives, the courage to fight, the ability to win, and the blessings of victory, the courage to fight. Um, My dad was telling me this story, and I thought I would share it. It's really a perfect picture. Um, When he was in seventh grade, he was coming home from church with his family, and he had his church clothes on. It was back when you really dressed up for church. He had his sports coat and his nice pants and his church shoes. And my papa, um, my grandfather, which is my dad's father, he was a tough, tough guy, charismatic, a Marine in World War II, a boxer, a wrestler, and by trade, he was a home builder. So they're on their way home from church, and his dad said, I'm going to go look at one of my home properties and check on things. And my dad says he remembers pulling up next to it, and there were some eighth grade boys, they were a year older than my dad, vandalizing the property. They were taking bricks and throwing them and crushing them and messing with the stuff, and my papa rolled down the window, and he said, you guys get on out of here. You guys need to get off this property. And they talked back to him. They said, this isn't your property. You don't own this. And he goes, as a matter of fact, I do. And I'm going to give you one more chance to get off the property. And the boys said, we're not going anywhere. And so my papa looked back at my dad. My dad's name's Mike. And he said, Mike, make him leave. And my dad said he had to like muster up this courage to fight. He was going, well, I'm in my church clothes. And he goes, make him leave. And so my dad gets out of the car and they're older than him and there's a group of them and the mouthy one steps out. And my dad goes, okay, I guess it's going to be him. I'm going to fight. It's kind of like this standoff, like David and Goliath. So my dad goes up against him. And my dad was a wrestler, but, you know, he was little. And he said he pulled up his, his sleeves and, and he just went after him. And they had this battle and they're rolling around and my dad's punching him and his whole family's watching. And my dad said his sport coat got caught kind of up around his head and he couldn't see. And so my papa stopped the fight and said, here, Mike, take off your coat. My dad took it off and threw it down. Then he rolled his sleeves back up and he said he was getting ready to go back after him. And that kid got scared and he said, you know what, we'll leave will leave. And my dad had victory. And he just felt so happy. He's like, woo, I defeated Goliath. He kind of felt like he had this victory. And I tell you this because 
I just think if this is our land. God has land for us. He has promises for us. He has places he wants to take us. And we have enemies who are going to come at us. Just like we see in David and Goliath and say, no, you can't have this land. And they're going to shout profanity at us and discourage us. And God's in heaven going, make them leave. Make them leave. You have that kind of power to take down the enemy. We're going to see this play out here in the story. David said, who is this guy? Who, who, why are we afraid of this guy? And his brothers that were on the battle line heard David ask this. And they said, why have you even come down here? Who did you leave those few little sheep with that you watch in the desert? We know how conceited you are, how wicked your heart is. You just came down here to watch the battle. They talked down to him. They belittled him. David said, what have I done? Can I not even speak? He turned away from his brothers and he started asking other people what's going on. And King Saul called him over. And King Saul said, what's going on? And David looked at King Saul and he said, listen, let no one lose account. On, on, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. I'll go fight him. David's going, I have the courage to fight him. I'll take care of him. He wasn't afraid to fight on behalf of God's people. He knew what was at stake. It was their freedom. And he wasn't going to tolerate this. And see, there's times we have to have the courage to fight. We've got to fight for our promised land, for the promises that God's given us. We have to have courage. Before Joshua took God's people into the promised land, he was afraid of the battles he was going to have to fight. And listen to what the Lord said to him in Joshua 1.9. God said, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't you be afraid. Don't you be discouraged. I am with you. I'm with you wherever you go. God is with us. He wants us to step out in courage and make him leave. Make the enemy leave when he's trying to keep us between going in our promised land, between God's best. He says, make him leave. David had the courage to fight. And see, David wouldn't tolerate the evil. He wasn't going to stand for it. And it takes courage to have a standard. It takes courage. I mean, we live in a world where it's just tolerance. Just don't be offended. Just don't hurt anybody. There are times it's okay to have some righteous anger. When evil comes against you, it's okay to be offended. God wants you to. He said, have the courage to fight for the things of God. And Jesus didn't hesitate to fight giants during his earthly ministry. He took on the religious leaders of the day. He was constantly confronting the Pharisees, the lawmakers, people who were burdening God's people with rules and keeping them from moving forward with God. Listen to his language in Matthew 23, 13. Jesus says, woe to you, Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You're not going to get in yourselves, but you're not allowing anybody to get in. He's saying, listen, you are standing between me and my people, between my people and the kingdom. Move, move. Jesus didn't tolerate evil. David didn't tolerate evil. And his brothers were angry at him. And I want to park here for a minute. They're mad. He had courage. They're mad. It made them look bad. They're going, get in line. Cower in fear like everybody else. Fear wants company. And I love how David turned away from him. See, God gives us permission to turn away from people who are filling our minds with fear. Fear is not from God. Fear is not from God. In 2 Timothy, God says, I didn't give you the spirit of fear. I gave you the Holy Spirit. I gave you the Holy Spirit. He goes, I give you power, love, and a sound mind. When our minds are filled with fear, we don't make good choices. We can't move forward in freedom. And David tells Saul, I'll fight him. And listen to Saul, he discourages him. He says, you're not able to go fight this Philistine. You're only a boy. He's been a fighting man from his youth. See, his brothers discouraged him. The king discouraged him. And see, these are people that are supposed to be on his team. They're they're all in it together. And um, I just want to pause here. One of my friends told me this last week. I was talking to her and she said I could share it. I'm not going to say her name. But she said, you know, I, I'm really, um, we were just making small talk, and she goes, you know, I'm really proud of myself. I, I'm going to give up alcohol for a while, for a year. And I said, oh, well, good for you. She goes, you know, it's getting a hold of me. It's becoming a little too important to me, and, and I just want to detox. And she said, but I've really grieved it. She goes, I've cried and cried. And I said, is it giving up the alcohol or the addiction? What is it? And she goes, no, I'm going to lose all my friends. And I said, no, surely you're not going to lose your friends. She goes, no, no, I am. I already have. She goes, that was what we did together. We went to happy hours. We shared a bottle of wine. We, we, everything we did was centered around alcohol. And she goes, and they're discouraging me. They're saying, oh, you don't have a problem with it. I mean, don't be a fun killer. I mean, come on, you don't need to give it up. And she goes, they're discouraging me. And I can't move forward because I, I feel like I'm be- God has better for me. And they're not letting me move forward. And I just want to pause here and say, sometimes people that we love, family and friends, the closest people to us, won't let us go kill those giants that are keeping us from God's best. And they're they're holding us back. 
And there are times we've got to turn away from him and say, no, no, I'm not going to be put off by you. I got to kill this giant. And we got to support each other. I looked at her and I said, listen, I'll be your friend. I'll be your friend. We want, we want to help people reach where God's taken them. We don't want to be the ones holding people back from killing giants in their life. It takes courage to fight giants. It takes courage to turn away from people trying to stop you. But see, David wasn't put off by his brothers. He wasn't put off by Saul. He said, I'll go fight him. And Saul said, the Lord be with you. And sometimes he's the only one who is. Sometimes it's just you and God going against that giant. The first point, God will give us the courage we need to fight Goliaths. He'll give us the courage we need to fight Goliaths. And he'll give us the ability to win, point number two. My son Barrett, he's now almost 15, but when he was nine, eight or nine, we started doing a little wrestling classes with him, thinking, oh, we'll, do, we'll teach him some self-defense. So we dabbled in it. And, and after just a couple lessons, my, husband's go, my husband said, let's put him in a little tournament, a novice, a beginner tournament, just see where he stands against his peers. And I said, well, that's a good idea. So we signed him up, and the day of the tournament came, and we got him kind of ready in his shorts and t-shirt. We said, okay, let's go. When we got there, I got a little nervous, because I thought, ooh, I don't know if you're familiar with the wrestling world, but I was like, this is not novice. I mean, these kids, I mean, they had the cauliflower ears, their, their neck, they didn't have much of a neck. I mean, they're, just, they're short, they had the singlets, wrestling outfits on, and they're walking around, and I mean, I'm intimidated by them. And I was going, are you sure this is a beginner? And my husband said, well, I mean, it said it was. Well, they were signing him up for his division, and there was a kid standing there with a red mohawk, huge, in his age group, and I thought, ooh, I hope he didn't have to wrestle him. Well, sure enough, I am not making this up, that was his first opponent. The, the kid with the mohawk comes out on the mat, and Barrett's so nervous. I mean, he's just like kind of sitting there. And I said, go on, go on out there. Do your best. You got it. And I mean, I literally, Reese was, my husband's trying to coach him up. Barrett walks out there and I go up to the bleachers and I cry my eyes out. I, I sat up there and I, he didn't see me, but I was just like, oh, what have we done? He's going to die. His kid's going to kill him. And he gets out there and because he's athletic, he went kind of far with him. We were proud of him. His adrenaline kicked in and he did good, but eventually he got pinned and we, got, we decided we're sticking to soccer. This is too intense. We're not doing this anymore, but he did well. But my point is, and this telling you the story is God doesn't just throw us out on the wrestling mat against these scary looking giants and say, good luck. I mean, I hope you do okay out there. No, God gives us tools. He gives us weapons. He prepares us for the battle. Before David went on the battlefield, King Saul was trying to discourage him. And David looked at him and he said, listen, King Saul, I've been keeping my father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it. I rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, I seized it by the hair. I struck it and I killed it. He said, your servant has killed the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he's defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. He had confidence. God had trained him in the ordinary, in the mundane, in the seemingly mundane. He was teaching him, honing his skills in the small setbacks, in the small victories. God's preparing him, preparing him, preparing him for a battle. He's doing the same with you. How does this translate spiritually? God prepares us in the routine, in the normal, in the ordinary for the battles that we're going to face. And what are our weapons? What's our slingshot? David became an expert at his slingshot. What's our weapons and how do we use them? Second Corinthians 10, 4, the Bible says the weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. A stronghold is anything that's standing between you and God's best for you. We have that kind of power. God gives us spiritual weapons that we can fight against Goliath. I'm going to list a few today. I have them here for you so you can look at them. He gives us the weapon of his word. There's power in the Bible. There's power in the living word of God. We can speak to the giants coming against us. We can speak to them. We can say, listen, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Listen, I already have victory in Christ. Listen, I'm more than a conqueror. If God's for me, you can't be against me. Who can be against me? And we can speak to these giants in our life. And when we speak truth, we demolish their lies because all they are is a lie. That's all they are. The second is the weapon of prayer. When we pray, we're inviting the supernatural power of God into our natural circumstances. Prayer changes things. God hears our prayers and he acts on our behalf. We have the weapon of worship. Number three, we can fight. Um, or the weapon of worship, it doesn't just involve singing and praising God. It's an attitude of the heart. 
It's elevating God above everything else in our life. And it's saying you're first. And when we worship God, we're absorbing his power into our being. Finally, we have the weapon, or next we have the weapon of his name. We don't fight in our name alone. We fight in the name of Jesus. We fight in the name of Jesus. There's power in saying the name of Jesus. It says, the Bible says, when you say the name of Jesus, the demons tremble. You can just speak it. I'm coming at you in the name of Jesus. Jesus has given me victory. Speak it to your giant. The weapon of fasting. This is a spiritual discipline, and I don't want us to underestimate this. When we fast, we're preparing our bodies and our minds for battle. We're eliminating distractions. We're focusing in, and I love what the Bible says in Isaiah 58 in regard to fasting. It says it looses the bonds of wickedness. It sets the oppressed free, and it breaks off every yoke. I love that. We have the weapon of a testimony. David remembered how God was faithful to him and how God had prepared him. And he drew from those experiences and applied it to his present day battle. We have a testimony, even in our failures, we learn and we apply it to our battles today. And finally, the weapon of thanksgiving. We can thank God in advance for what he's going to do. Gratitude opens the door to God's power and it disarms the enemy. It confuses him. It confuses him. We can use these weapons to fight and take down our Goliaths. David was going to go fight and Saul tried to put all of his armor on David. He said, here, wear my tunic, wear my armor. And David says, I, I can't go in these. I'm not used to them. I mean, they don't fit me. This, this isn't me. And I just want to make a small point here. People are always going to give us opinions. I mean, they're going to discourage us from fighting the giants, or they're going to tell us how they would fight the giants. I mean, I'd say this, or I'd do this, or, or I, would, I would handle it this way. But see, we got to fight our own battles our own way. We don't have to wear what other people want to put on us. We can seek God's advice, and we seek God and seek other people's advice, but we don't have to listen to every opinion. David had to go fight the battle. God had prepared him to fight. He says, I can't go in these. It's going to keep me from victory. David chose five stones from a stream, and he put them in his sling bag. And I, and I found this picture in Italy, and I just wanted to share it with you. We went to Italy a few summers ago, and this picture just captured me. It's a sculpture of David with his slingshot about to face the giant Goliath. And I love that. I'm going to leave that up. He grabbed five stones, put them in his sling, and he was ready to go on the battlefield, he approached Goliath, and Goliath mocked him. He saw that he was only a boy, and the Bible says he despised him. He says, am I a dog that you come with me with sticks? And he cursed David by his gods, and he said, I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. He's trying to scare him, but David looked at him, and he said, you come against me with a sword and spear, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. He says his name, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. David said, this day, I will, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I'll strike you down and I'll cut off your head. And today I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know there is one God in Israel. And all those gathered here will know it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. The battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. As the Philistine giant moved closer to attack him, David ran toward the battle line. He was not timid. He reached in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, struck the Philistine in the forehead. The Bible says it sank in his forehead and he fell face down to the ground. Verse 50, so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And then he ran over him, drew the sword from his sheath, and he cut off his head. And I picture him just grabbing the Goliath's hair like he'd done to the lion and the bear. He was ready. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they ran in fear, and the men of Judah shouted in victory. I love how David said, this day, this day, you're going down. This day, daily we get to decide if we're going to let giants oppress us. Let's not put it off. This day, decide to take down your Goliath. And David killed this Goliath with one stone. With one stone. One stone with God goes a long way. It may seem small. You may think, you know, I just have a little bit of faith. I mean, I just have a little bit of courage. And, but we can bring that to God and he'll multiply it. The Bible says the faith of a mustard seed can move mountains. I don't know what that looks like for you. You sling in your one stone. Slinging one stone might look like choosing to write one check towards your giant debt. 
Slinging your one stone might look like choosing not to return a text from that toxic friend and getting your power back. Slinging your one stone might look like changing your locks and saying, I'm not letting this destructive person into my house until they get some help. They're ruining my family. Slinging your one stone might look like taking one small step of faith to take down the giant of fear. But one stone with God can take down a giant. One stone with God can take down a giant. And David didn't just take him down, he cut off his head. Victors in the ancient world would cut off their enemy's head as a token of victory, and it left no question that they were dead. I mean, they were dead. And God doesn't want us to just strike down the giants, he wants us to cut off the head. He wants them dead. And a head represents authority. We're under the head of Jesus. He's the head, we're the body. We don't want to be under authority of any other giant. God says, cut the head off. And there's symbolism here I want to hit on. In Genesis 3.15, God prophesied to Satan, the serpent, in the Garden of Eden. He says, from the seed of a woman will come a Messiah who will crush your head. This is foreshadowing Jesus crushing the head of Satan on the cross. The killing power of a snake is in its head. When Jesus crushed his head on the cross, he took away the sting, the power of sin and death. When it has no power over us. Satan wants to deceive us, but in Christ, we have the power to overcome giants and crush their heads. Second point, God empowers you with weapons and he gives you the ability to win. He gives you the ability to win. Finally, David had the blessings of victory. When you take the giant out in your life, you can enjoy your freedom. You can enjoy the land, claim the land that God wants to give you. The abundant life that Jesus meant for you. And it doesn't mean that life's going to be perfect and there's not going to be giants. But you'll know how to fight them. You'll gain confidence. And you can continue to move forward in freedom with Jesus. And when you take down giants, you'll help other people take down giants in their life. You'll inspire them and help them move forward with Jesus. David would go on to fight many battles and many Goliaths that would come against him during his, the rest of his life and as his time as king. And I want to close with this verse in 2 Samuel 7, 18. David, at the end of his life, when he was looking back over all that God had done, over all the victories God had given him over the Goliaths that came against him, he said these words. It says, the king David went in and sat before the Lord. And he said, who am I, sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? He's going, who am I? that you've given me this victory. Who am I that you've helped me come this far? Final point, God delights in seeing us walk in the blessings of victory. He wants us to be giant slayers. Thank you so much for joining me in the With You series. God is with you. God loves you and he wants to empower you. Thank you.